Ann Holt and welcome to Tennessee's Black Heritage. I'm standing in the Tennessee State Museum's newest exhibit, Slaves and Slaveholders of Wessington Plantation. And the Wessington Plantation is where we begin tonight on a high-tech hunt for one man's family tree. Stephen Yorker's job is, well, different. And avoid. Using a modified baby stroller, Yurka is on a high-tech hunting expedition. He hopes to find human graves. We use ground penetrating radar uh, and magnetics and other uh, instruments to measure uh, the physical changes underground. To look at the matrix and what we identify as anomalies, changes underground, and are they associated with the human burials that are at this alleged cemetery. Alleged because no one is completely sure where the graves are. I feel very close to my ancestors here. But John Baker Jr. is convinced this is the right place. Baker is a descendant of slave ancestors that lived and worked here at Wessington Plantation. We first profiled John in 2009. It was this photograph that started John Baker Jr. on his voyage of discovery. When I was in the seventh grade, there was a social studies uh, book called Your Tennessee. And uh, in chapter 10, there was a photograph of four former slaves, which is on the book cover. And I kept being drawn to this photograph uh, for some reason. What he didn't know was that these faces from the past were about to redirect his future. I said, Grandmother, this photograph is in our history book. And she said, uh, the couple seated. it. She said, that's my grandmother and grandfather. The photo was taken at a place known as Wessington Plantation, where John's ancestors had been slaves. Wessington Plantation encompassed over 13,000 acres. The plantation's owner, Joseph Washington, was a cousin of another famous Washington, George. At one time, Wessington was the largest tobacco plantation in America. It was also home to 250 slaves. Family. Where are you? John Baker has now researched every family line who lived here. Which brings us back to today. Sort of wondering exactly where I'm, my direct ancestors are buried because we know they were buried here but not the exact location. So we're hoping that this will give us an exact number or close to an exact number of the number of individuals that's buried here. The Tennessee State Museum commissioned this search for the slave burials here at Wessington as part of an exhibit the museum is hosting. Finding slave cemeteries is so rare. These usually were developed over because they didn't have markers. The, the knowledge that they were even there was lost by the early 20th century. The cemeteries that include um, enslaved people, typically, you know, the stones aren't uh, carved. They're actually chosen field stones a lot of times, and they're set vertically but to sort of an untrained eye, they don't quite look like headstones or footstones are the things we typically associate with burials. So that has led to the obscurity of these things. We're so fortunate that here at Wessington, there was such a strong community, slave community, that those stories got passed down about where those cemeteries were. So just for the preservation aspect, to preserve a place where uh, these enslaved people lived who helped build the state of Tennessee, that we know where they are, that we can honor them, I think is very important. From the data collected, a three-dimensional image of the site will show in detail what is here underground. There's a need for it because geophysics is a non-invasive technique, so you're not excavating. You're looking under, it's a chance to look underground without disturbing the context. We're hoping to see how many burials are actually in this plot. Uh, the, the burials that we know about have come from a variety of written and oral sources. There's no list that really says exactly who or how many are in the cemetery. This marker identifies who John Baker Jr. believes is buried here. For these ancestors and others who toiled here, it's another chance to tell their story. It sort of puts you along the timeline of everything else in relation to you, and it, and it can really give you a strong sense of place. And that's uh, really what heritage and archaeology is about. We, this heritage belongs to everybody, and, and when we can find a sense of place, it means something for identity and, and who we are as a community, as a region, as Americans. You can see what they found here at the Tennessee State Museum. You can also learn more about John Baker Jr.'s ancestors from his book, The Washingtons of Wessington Plantation. Up next, 
a famous African-American teams up with a Chicago businessman to change education in the South. Welcome back. In the early 1900s, education in the South was separate but far from equal. While communities spent tax dollars to build white schools, African American children attended what were schools in name only. But two men had a vision to change that. I got a good start. I, I'm not bragging, but I, I was a good student. Franklin Harper is proud of his education and proud of the school that started it all. It's hard to believe that. It, Eight grades were in, in this little building here. This little building is the Cairo School, one of thousands of Rosenwald schools. My dad had a third grade education and he always insisted that his children got a better education than he did so we didn't have to work as hard as he did. That we could use our brains instead of our hands. African American leader Booker T. Washington had the same idea educate a population not far removed from Reconstruction to better themselves. The facilities ranged widely, but generally uh, from awful to passable in the early 1910s. Many school districts spent their public funds for education on white schools and white school buildings, and only the smallest fraction of public school revenues actually went to black schools. This NAACP film shows the kind of conditions black children faced in the South. Children going to school in uh, churches, in buildings that were um, in some cases uh, that dated back to the Reconstruction period and there had been no money to keep them maintained, no money to heat them in the winter. So you have descriptions of log buildings where you know the wind is whistling in between the logs, the dirt floors. Despite the kinds of conditions their children would have to learn in, they insisted that a school be operated in their community. Washington's idea for better school buildings soon found a champion. In 1912, though, Julius Rosenwald, the president of Sears Roebuck, gave a rather large amount of money to Tuskegee Institute. Booker T. Washington then asked him, could we spend a portion of your donation to construct six model schools in communities around Tuskegee Institute? And that is the beginning of the Rosenwald School Building Program. By 1920, Rosenwald's building program was being operated out of offices in the Cotton States Building in Nashville. The Rosenwald program eventually reached 15 states uh, and built over 5,000 school facilities, not just schools, but also uh, vocational buildings and teachers' homes. Uh, but it began small and just gradually spread across southern states and then into the, the lower Midwest when they accepted Missouri into the program. But it operated in states that had segregated systems of public education only. The African American community in this area raised the first $500 toward the construction of this building. The building actually only cost $1,900 when it was built in the very, very early 20s. Sharing in the expense of building the school was key. That philosophy w worked. It, it's amazing how it instilled pride in each community because this belonged to us. Julius Rosenwald, as someone of the Jewish faith, he felt that he understood discrimination. He had experienced it himself. Um, and so that gave him uh, some sympathy and an understanding of what it might be like to be discriminated against by other, you know, for other reasons by other people. All the students of Cairo School knew was they loved their school. If it hadn't been for this school, there'd been a lot of us that would never even have gone to school, you know. It was just a big family, and back in those days, family was everything. We had a lot of fun here. We played the ball in the back here, but it was never a real softball. Some of the mothers made softballs out of socks and stuff and sold them together, so that was our ball. The Cairo Rosenwald School was refurbished by this community, but many of the Rosenwald schools haven't been so lucky. Well, often uh, they fell into disrepair 
It was one thing to get that school built, but to get a commitment to its maintenance and operation over the years, that was a little bit harder to get. With integration, most of the Rosenwald schools were left behind for newer buildings, but some survived, still bringing communities together so many years later, still teaching us the power of education. You can learn more about Tennessee's black heritage at our website, WKRN.com, and there you'll find a wealth of stories from past episodes of this program, as well as links to learn more about tonight's stories. Coming up, keeping history alive in the Bluff City. would be a good word to describe our next stop. It's a repository for Memphis culture like no other. Only fitting for a city like no other. Deep inside this downtown Memphis building, the culture of a people's past and present blend like colors of a rainbow. This is the Center for Southern Folklore. This place is a storehouse of knowledge and experiences of everyday people. Our mission is to let people know, not just the Center for Southern Folk, but really what Memphis is all about. What's the soul of the city? What's the people of the city? It's part art museum, part music venue, part cafe, part store. What's special and unique about the people and the music and the crafts, the things that aren't really talked about in books that much, but are part of people's soul. It all began as an effort to hold on to the past. We started making films, 16 millimeter films in the early 70s. And we started making films about fife makers and mule traders and artists and quilters. And the idea was that you were preserving and you were documenting in film things that were going to, were disappearing. And then things that were part of folk culture. I come up the hard way. And on the farm all of my day. They captured slices of time through films. People come from miles around to come to Beale Street. And I told a white fellow once, I said, hey man, if you were black for one Saturday night and on Beale Street, never would you want to be white again. And photographs like these by Reverend L. O. Taylor. Reverend Taylor in the early, in the late 20s, had a camera, and eventually a movie camera, and went around photo, making photographs of picture of people. We've recently, in the last couple of years, digitized 7,000 photographs that he did. Through music of artists like Mose Benson. Oh man, Mose. You know, he would, um, somebody, he'd say, come here child, sit down and he'd hold their hand, and you would, he would hold their hand, and, and they would play the piano. And so a lot of kids started playing piano because Mose would teach them. And through art. I'm gonna show you this one first. This is made out of African American. 90 year old Hetty Childress makes quilts the way her grandmother taught her. Well, this is called a tack out. And that's the reason my work is so much different. She remembers the hard life for African Americans when she was just a kid in Somerville, Tennessee. It was just like slavery out there. We didn't have food, clothes, we couldn't go to school. We had to work all this summer. Then when we got the crops in, we didn't have anything for the winter. So we, just, we was just living in peerless times out there. That's the back. Now we're going to turn it to the front. Okay. All right. Now here what's going to knock you out. When kids come in and they hear a musician or they see Miss Hattie talk about quilts or Frank Lilly talk about art, it moves them. I mean, it's somebody really talking to them. But it's more than saving the past. It's saving the present as well. We're not looking at like PM whiskey, past memories. We're looking at what's happening today in people's lives. And if we can begin to continue to document, record, learn about, present, share with, now that we have Facebook, share with people. Uh, we've done our mission. All in a juke joint atmosphere that says, have a seat. I want to tell you something. 
you'll see photographs, you'll see quilts, but that's just the beginning of how we, we've come up with how we want to share the images, share the narratives. It has to be alive. I mean, you know, anybody can read a book and go to sleep. You like that? The Center for Southern Folklore is open from 10 to 5, Monday through Fridays, and special times for music shows. We can link you to their website from ours, WKRN.com. When we come back, a Nashville couple changing the futures of Nashville students. city kids, short on money but long on hope, the thought of going to college can seem like a far off dream, but a Nashville coach and his wife are helping to bring that dream within reach. At a quarter to seven, we don't really do any uh, advertising. On a Saturday, we don't do any marketing. The last place you would expect to find high schoolers, the kids find out about it, is school. Some of our children that come to us uh, don't uh, don't eat, uh, don't have a lot of times food as we may think they do. But it's not just feeding their stomachs that gets them out of bed, it's feeding their minds. Good morning, good morning. We officially have started. This is In Full Motion, a program that grew out of Coach Maurice Fitzgerald's years of coaching high school sports. It really became a ministry more so than a, than a program because uh, it, 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 it encased the whole student as, uh, as one that's leaving home, that's coming to us, that we have to embrace all the things that they came from. Coach Fitzgerald knows where they come from. He came from there too. As a young man growing up in the Edge Hill housing projects, he saw the challenges. I saw so many of my friends uh, not going beyond high school. I saw a lot of them to drop out of high school. I saw a lot of them to turn to crime and other things that I wasn't raised to do, but there were reasons. Uh, but if you got uh, a student involved in something that was positive, there's something that was enriching, that uh, they could have an outlet. So while winning back-to-back -back state football championships, Coach Fitzgerald had bigger dreams for his students. They were graduating at a rate of a probably 99% in Metro schools when the graduation rate here at Pearl Cone was 47%. So he comes home to me and he says, I want to win the game of life. I want them to get to college. Coach's wife, Cynthia, knows the problem too. It reminds me of growing up in Napier projects and having the grades and not seeing anybody around me able to leave the housing projects. They can't see uh, beyond uh, what they can see. And it's not, it is, it is history. History says that in, in North Nashville, minority public school, lower socioeconomic students, they will not finish college, except for a small percentage. What stands between students and a college education is a test the ACT. It's the process, it's test taking strategies, it's, it's time management, it's being disciplined, uh, it's, it's being on point, it's being focused. In full motion teaches the fundamentals of taking the college test, much like Coach Fitzgerald taught the fundamentals of football. Once they find out uh, the rules of the game, then they're able to play it a little better. They pay, you know, $20 to be in the program forever. We pay for them to have a good nutritious meal, pay for them to take the test. We take them on college tours. We give them tutors, the best teachers in the state. And then coach is the best mentor in the world. It's Fitzgerald's way of changing the history they grew up in. If they are able to go to college, chances are they won't be uh, uh, take that road of crime. So, and it also gives uh, uh, this community a sense of pride that uh, there are good things that can come out of North uh, West Nashville. Their message has resonated with over a thousand kids from 122 schools in Middle and East Tennessee. And in full motion is changing the future of these kids. I'm gonna go to college. I'm not sure yet. I've got accepted some places, but I'm still trying to figure out where I see myself. I have a few colleges already looking at me, so 
there's no telling what my potential could be. I believe that we are making a difference. I believe that uh, we're helping students uh, not follow history, but to make history. And that's what we do. Coach Fitzgerald continues to make history for the kids of In Full Motion. This spring, he and his wife will lead another group of prospective college students on a tour of colleges through Alabama and Florida. We hope you have enjoyed this trip through Tennessee's African American history, and we've only scratched the surface of the many interesting people and places that you can learn about when you explore Tennessee's black heritage.